Hey there, my name's Crew, and welcome to our YouTube channel today. While you're here, we hope this content does three things. Firstly, helps you discover God. Secondly, help you develop yourself. And thirdly, that'll deploy you into leadership with a biblical worldview. Before you go, make sure you like, share, comment, subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the content. And uh, I am just honored today to get to be with this precious one, Pastor Precious. And uh, some of my favorite times are us getting to share together. And you know, Sheila, uh, I think about Linda's story and it's so inspiring because um, y'all had 54 years together. That'd be right, 54 years and how amazing that is. And, um, and sometimes we look at our relationships, you know, when you're, when you're in your 20s, when you're in your 30s, when you're in your 40s. It really wasn't until I was 60. Now, I've always sort of seen the end from the beginning. That's one of my... Uh, processes in my life to be able to look at my life and really be able to see the end from the beginning and then try to live my life basically the way that I would want to end well. And I think that's a positive thing. I think it's something that we can do all do and we can all do more of. But really, uh, all growing up, I would tell our girls, I would tell Josh, I would say, I miss you already. Like, I miss you already. And they'd go, well, Daddy, we're right here. And I go, I know, there's gonna come a day, girls, when y'all marry some hairy-legged boy, and uh, we're gonna have to invite him into our family, and how's that gonna be? And then you're gonna have your own children, and, and then, Josh, you're gonna hopefully marry not a hairy-legged girl, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, but, and then we'll have to embrace them into our family. And there's all these different seasons. But what I tried to do in our family, Sheila, we're talking about relationships today, that God wants you to have the best relationships. Come on. He wants you to have the more that he wants you to have. And that comes through our relationships. But I've always tried to live with this sense of knowing that I'm not going to live forever, that we're not going to live forever and it, it causes you to cherish each day and not to take days for granted. And specifically in your marriage uh, as a template for every other relationship, not waste days where you're upset, waste days where you, you just have unresolved conflict uh, because unresolved conflict when it gets stacked day after day after day, Sheila, leads to irreconcilable differences. Like you can't reconcile it. Why? Because you didn't resolve the conflict of that day. We talk a lot about this in our, in our couple's mastermind. We talk a lot about the rules for marriage and having rules that you, that you live, uh, not, not in terms of, of restricting you, but that give you the freedom to be everything that God's called you to be. And one of those rules is, is to really resolve your anger within a 24 hour period. And your marriage is your practice to be healthy emotionally. A lot of people don't understand that, but we're not here today just to talk about marriage. But again, marriage becomes, it was the original institution of God. And he even tailored the church after marriage that, that, Jesus is the head and we're the body, that we're his bride. And so, so everything is based on relationships. Our true happiness, our true joy that we have in life, our sense of meaning and purpose is connected to our relationships. And again, back to Linda's story, it's not like, well, when her husband's gone, I just, there's no more life to live. No, for whatever reason, there's an assignment on your life from God that's directly related to your alignments, but watch this. Your alignments, you, 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 we have no way of picking when we, when we will, will die. That it, it, suicide is not an option. It's like God does not want that to be an option because he's given you your life as a gift. And, and part of the reason people get so upset and get to a point where they feel like they wanna take their life, it's usually somehow connected to a relationships or relationships that have gone wrong. And I just think about this. I think about like, like you know, the, I think about the movie Notebook, you know, that the perfect case scenario would be that you got to die together with your spouse, that you just went to sleep and you both woke up in heaven, right? But the reality is that's probably not gonna happen. One of you is gonna outlive the other and women on the average outlive men six more years. 
And I don't know why that is, but I'm fighting to beat those odds because if you're going to live six more years, I'm going to live six more years. But, but yet God, let me just say this too. I think we can lose ourselves sometimes in our relationships or in our marriage that, you know, we are all individuals and we have our own meaning and purpose in life. Yeah. But sometimes the, either it's the longer you're connected. Of course, you you know, I come alongside you and, you know, support you. But then I've got things that I'm passionate about, things that I'm gifted in. And so it's finding myself in our relationship or just in my life of, of really pursuing the things that I enjoy and the things that I'm yeah. passionate about. And so, you know, in our lives, we have to all think that way to go, okay, we, we're not just who we're married to. We're not just the relationships. Those relationships are important and they affect who we are. They affect what we do with our life. But then, you know, there's that time in your life that you come to that revelation too, that I can still do things separate from Pastor Keith, that the things that yes. I'm passionate about, you're not necessarily always passionate about because mine involves more of the doing. Yes. And that's a part of my life language is, you know, is that. And so. That's why you were one of the first people I hired (laughs) because I had to have a doer in my life. So I said, listen, I don't want to just be married to you, but I want to pay you to be married to me. And so that, that's really worked out well for us. And I think the longer that we have been, uh, you know, lived life, not just been married, but the longer that we've lived life, you really do like in your early years, you just, you don't think of much about the end of your life because you just feel like you're going to live forever. You feel like your kids are never going to grow up. They're always going to be babies. They're always going to stay in this immature stage. And then life just happens. And all of a sudden you're like, you're counting. We started doing that counting the end of our life and how close that looks as compared to when we were in our 20s and 30s, we're not feeling like we're going to get, you know, it's going to take a long time to get to be, you know, old. And now we're in that stage. Yes, Sheila, I heard somebody (laughs) say this. Don't focus on your age, focus on your energy. And that's why we, we will never we're act We're always going to keep our we energy. We are going to keep our energy. Yes. And so, so don't act. that keeps you young. Don't act your age, act your energy. Yeah. And so when you realize, like, what is, it, what is it that energizes you? What is it that brings energy to you? What is it that gives you energy? When you can really understand that, I'm going to tell you something. You'll be forever young. You'll be forever young based on your energy. So you've got to find out, first of all, what is it about you that that potentially could bring energy to other people. What is it about you? It's a part of your 1% that brings energy to other people, but then really identifying who and what gives me energy. So one of the reasons, Sheila, I work out, that we work out now, I'm just just telling you guys, this is in my life, this is one of the greatest seasons of my life because uh, we've had gyms in our home our whole life, Sheila has allowed me to have right in the middle of our house at other times build a garage, other times build a barn, uh, but we've, we've had a home gym and I've always worked out by myself uh, except from the different dogs that have lived and died through my workouts. Uh, but you know, I've had dogs that have been there in there working out with me and then Josh, you know, a couple of times when he was growing up, a couple of times, I can count on one hand, we would work out together. <laughs> And, uh, and later on in life now, like, like yesterday, he said, he, he called me and I said, what, 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 are you, what are you doing? He said, I was at the gym working out. Like every time I hear him say that, I go, why didn't you call me? Like, why didn't you tell me? Don't you realize I like to work out with you? But here's what I know about him. He likes alone time. That's why if you ever see him in the gym, just do him a favor, don't talk to him. I mean, for real, if you ever see him go, Hi, Pastor Josh, or something, but don't come up to him like someone did recently and say, as he's working out, are you okay? Because, man, you look like, anyway, he's lost. He got sick and he's lost. How many pounds have you lost? 20 pounds. But, and so, so, so it, you look a little gaunt, I guess, to people. I don't know. They're, they're seeing you all puffy and explosive. And, and now, but anyway, I just find it so interesting. People, that, people just don't even realize, like they'll walk up, you're working out, 
This is why I've had gyms at my house, by the way, because you're working out, you're trying to be focused. We say, hey, Pastor Keith, hey, Pastor Josh. And either they'll say something like that, like, are you okay? Because you just don't look good. Um, and, and here you are working out, you're pushing through. But anyway, okay. As we're talking about growing, yes, the we're bo- talking the bottom, about growing the in our relationship. What I was going to say is, <laughs> what's so great about this season is Pastor Sheila has decided she wants to work out with me. I'm like, like she's always had her own little workout thing. And like, I'll watch her work out and go. I'm still pressing weights. You, you don't it's know just... what you're doing. Just, that's, I'm not going to say anything, but. Listen, girl, I could take you to a whole nother level. So anyway, so I'm not just coaching you, but we're working. You're just following me in my workout. Right. It's so amazing. It is amazing. I mean, the I other day it. she was standing there. Second I saw her Peter. bicep. One. I saw her bicep and I thought, <laughs> girl, you are getting it, man. You're improving. I'm so proud of you. Way to go. Way to go. Let's go over the scripture here, Second Peter. This is the foundation for everything that we're teaching y'all. And it's Second Peter chapter one, verses eight through 11. The more you grow like this, everybody say that, the more you grow like this. Grow like what? We're gonna talk about it. The more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge, not somebody else's knowledge, but the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted, they're blind, and they're forgetting that they've been cleansed from their old sins. Being cleansed, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but being cleansed from your old sins is being free from your old way of doing things that kept you where you've always been. So it's not just about, well, okay, good. You know, we, we focus so much on, well, I did something wrong and my, my sins are, are forgiven. God also wants to cleanse you, wash you, make you free from, from thought processes, paradigms, paradigms, the way that you do your life, the way that you do your marriage, the way that you do your money that doesn't work. So you don't get stuck. Most people get stuck because like Albert Einstein is famous for saying that if you keep doing the same things over and over and expect different results, you're insane. Like you're insane, but a lot of people just think they get set and they get settled in the way things are. And that's where you stop being as productive and useful as you could be because you're short-sighted. You're doing more of what, what, it, what you need to do right now that you think you need to do without a long-term focus. So again, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their old sins, your old ways of thinking, your old ways of being, your old ways of doing. In fact, if I'm gonna just invite you to do something. Put your hand on your head with me and just say, Lord, help me Lord, help not me. to think in any way that would hold me back from what you think about me what you think for me and for what you have for my future. In Jesus' name. Come on, y'all. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. And again, we said this a few weeks ago, you are called and chosen by God. Would you just say that with me? I am called and chosen by God. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Sheila, if we're gonna grow in our relationships, We talked a little bit last time about compassion. It's the antidote for blaming and shaming. And I wanna jump off here. What is compassion in our relationships? It is the ability to feel and understand the emotional state of another person and respond with empathy, kindness, and support. It literally means, if I have compassion, to suffer or feel with someone else. And Sheila, I think probably in our relationship, that is the thing that we need to continually, not only you and I, but everybody needs to continue to grow in their compassion 
And that's been our focus, really. Right. And we can respond with empathy, but empathy and sympathy are two totally different yeah. things. Because you can think about that in relationships, when somebody has been empathetic towards you, when it's a spouse or a friend, then you're endeared to that person. They're emotionally connected with your emotions. They're being empathetic towards what you're going through, trying to understand you. But when you have sympathy for someone, you're just, you have like, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you. And really you just kind of go on with your life. It's not that like coming back and reconnecting, making sure somebody's okay. There's more of that emotional support whenever you're empathetic for, towards someone. So we need to have more of that in our relationships. But I think we can get cynical, we can get you know, frustrated with our spouse, with sometimes our friends, because sometimes we can think, well, if you'll just do this or you'll just do that, then you know, you, we'll, you, we'll be able to solve all your problems. But that's not showing empathy in a relationship because we all come from different places yeah. of where we are emotionally, how we're dealing with situations, whether it's in our relationships or just dynamics just in life. And so I know when I can be more empathetic towards what you're going through and not just have sympathy towards you, but really be empathetic, there's gonna be more of a connection between us and there's gonna be more intimacy between us. So it's important on to be compassionate in our relationships. There's certain things that we all need to do and that's what we're gonna be talking about yeah. today. Well, you know, Jesus was great at this. He said, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I want you to cast your cares on me. Why? Because I care for you. And this was, a, this was coming from a place, when you talk about compassion, it's coming from a place of seeking to understand that person before you seek to be understood. It's seeking to be compassionate towards someone rather than being focused on yourself. You know, that's why, again, Jesus said this. He said, judge not lest you be judged also. For by the same measure that you judge, it'll be measured back to you. He also said this, he said, don't, don't point out the speck in somebody else's eye when you have a beam sticking out of the side of your head. No, it's I gotta move the beam in my eye to point out what's wrong with you. And, and when we cease to really, Sheila, have compassion in our relationship. So when you grow like this, grow in your compassion. I mentioned again a few weeks ago that particularly in the book of Mark, Matthew doesn't say it as much, although he does cite Jesus a few times this way. Luke doesn't say it. John doesn't say it. And, but, but Mark, in all, the gospel, in, in all the gospels, Mark highlights this before every miracle of Jesus. It says he was moved with compassion. He was moved with understanding towards this person, not trying to get this person to understand him. You see, in your, mar your marriage is your practice, Sheila, and that's why we talk about marriage is not only the first institution of God, but, but marriage is, is a template. It's a template for business. It's a template for every other relationship that you'll ever have. And some people never figure this out. They never figure this out. In fact, if you've, if you've experienced divorce, let me just say this. Don't just look at what the other person did that caused the divorce. Look at yourself no matter, no matter if, they, if they were all wrong in your mind and you did not cause the divorce to happen, but you just couldn't live in that situation anymore, whatever it is, whatever the, wherever there was a reason for that relationship to be broken, just remember this. If you don't learn your own life lessons, you'll take what you didn't learn in that situation into the next situation. And some people think it's about, well, if I could just marry a different person, like wherever you go, there you are. So when you learn your own lessons of why did, how could I have loved this person and now I don't feel that love for, for this person? How could I be in a business relationship with somebody or in, in any kind of relationship with somebody and it not work out? What, what made it not work? And sometimes, Sheila, you can't, you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and you can't work somebody else's salvation, their sozo, their ability to be free, their ability to be whole, their ability to be well. That's what it means. Work out your own freedom. Work out your own uh, identity. Work out your own salvation, your own walk with God with fear and trembling and honoring God, but knowing, man, I need God. Like I need God in my thinking. I need God in my being. I need God in my doing. So I've got I've to work this out. 
If you get focused on what that other person isn't, whether it's in your marriage or in another relationship, and you start judging them as being this way or that way, you're not operating in compassion. I want you to see that. And when you don't have compassion, you will lose your passion for a person. You'll lose your passion for that relationship. So again, how do you, how do you be, become more compassionate in your relationship? You, you, go, you walk with understanding. You choose to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. I have a, a leadershipology. A friend is someone who will listen for the purpose of understanding you better. And if I could just say, too, as it relates to having uh, understanding in your relationship, it's going to take compromise. But many times in our relationship, we don't want to compromise. We want to draw strong lines. We want to say, no, this is the way it is. But we, need to, we are going to have to compromise in our relationships because either your standards or your way of thinking is totally different than the other person. So it's like, how in my relationship can I give a compromise here? How can I be okay? We talked about this also a couple of weeks ago about somebody in the relationship being a little bit more average. Because if we're going to have to bring understanding, we want everybody to come up to our level. We want everybody to know, you know, this is who we are. These are our core values. This is our mission statement. We got it all down. And you're being average. You're not, you're not elevating to this standard of what we've held for our family or what's in our business. But you're going to have to resolve that there's going to be some averageness in the relationships so you keep excelling you keep being the role model you keep being the example so eventually that person that's you're in relationship with that person that you are married to will see your life and they'll want to do better because you've been a great role model for that and so it takes somebody if you're going to be understanding and you're going to have that understanding in your relationship, you're going to have to be a confident person. Because if you walk in insecurity, it becomes all about you and your point of view and the way that you think it ought to go. And so if you're confident, you can bring more understanding into the relationship. The stronger you are in any area of your life, the more mercy you're going to have to give to everybody else around you. I want you to really get that. Like the more strong, the stronger you are and the more you, you have excellence in a given area, then what it does is, is in that area of strength is where you have to find your compassion for other people, not in your weakness. Does that make sense? So it's not like, oh, I'm weak in that area too, so I understand. No, 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 no. The stronger you are, and usually you're going to be married to somebody who does not have the strengths that you have, does not have the same weaknesses that you have, hopefully, that y'all will be able to help each other, but you can be compassionate for somebody. Why? Because you're not like them. You're not, you're not wired the same way. You might be strong, where they're, where they're weak, and that's what gives you the ability to have compassion. That was the secret of Jesus. He was the son of the living God. He was the perfect man. But guess what? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, the prophet Isaiah said, we are the healed. So in other words, out of his struggle, out of his own pain, out of his own resurrection, came the strength to be compassionate, the strength to be understanding, the strength to give empathy. The more insecure you are, listen very carefully to this, the more you're gonna wanna be understood. The more insecure you are, the more you're, you will want other people to know how you feel. And so you become defensive. I remember that early in our relationship because I was, I was an insecure. Not that I don't still have insecurities. We all do. Yeah. But early on in our relationship, I so, like if you pointed something out or we were discussing something in our relationship, because of my own insecurity, I wanted you to understand me and where I was coming from instead of me sitting in the seat to think, okay, there's going to be times I'm not going to be totally understood. But in this moment, can even naturally how I think, can I give up my right to be right? Because we talk about that, but it's like doing it's another thing because, you know, that takes confidence. I don't want to give up my right to be right because I'm right. And so I want to be right. I want you to know that I'm right. And so even when you would bring out, point out things, it was very hard for me because I came from a home where 
My mom always said I was perfect and I never did anything wrong. So if you pointed out something that you thought I wasn't perfect. Try being married then, to that, everybody. <laughs> Try so being like, no, married no, no. To, a, to a woman that their mother and their grandmother, I asked her grandmother one time, well, go ahead, you tell the story. Just said, you know, I just want to know because he got to be around this since I was 15. And so he just always saw that, you know, I was just always seemed to just do everything so perfect and felt like I, you know, even if I thought I was doing something wrong, I wanted to correct the wrong. But then I wanted to defend it too because I really did try to do things right. And sometimes you can get in that posture when you live that way, that's pride. Because you sit in that seat saying, no, I really want to You just to know you're the better person in every room. Like if you know you're the better person in every room, you're going to have to give mercy to everybody. That's the truth. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so he asked my grandmother, he said, I just want to know, has Sheila ever done anything wrong? She didn't bat her eyes. She didn't hesitate. She just said, no, she's never done anything wrong. She genuinely it felt that It gave me so way. much insight at 17. <laughs> I thought, okay, I know what I'm dealing with now. Like... This person is perfect. Like, how can we ever have a conversation about something gone wrong? Because I'm going to end up being wrong. So, so men, let me give you a tip. It's okay to take that position. What position? That, you know what? I'm probably wrong in this situation. And you know what? Just you saying that, that takes confidence. To do that, it just to, makes you feel so much better. No, but you know what? It makes me want to be better because by you doing that, I know that was always very hard for me to sit in that seat and to go, you know, to say that. I'll give, so, you, I'll give you an example of what happened recently. So we're playing tennis with our grandbabies, uh, Livy and Livy Lovey and Layla Shayla. So we're, we're out there playing tennis. Well, Livy, it just tries so hard and she's really pretty good. I mean, it's amazing. And so, but every time she miss hit the ball, she'd go, I'm sorry. She, I'm sorry. I go, like, where's that coming from? Like, you gotta feel like you've gotta apologize for missing a tennis ball. And I go, baby, listen, listen. You don't have to say you're sorry every time you miss. But here's what I wanna tell you. And this is going to be, this is, the light is about to come on for some people, right, when I tell you this. The more you want to do what's right, the more apologetic you'll be. But at the same time, if you have somebody in your life that's not striving to do what's right, the less apologetic they'll be. And you'll feel like you're the only one ever apologizing. Because you're the one trying to be a way that you see that you want to be, that that person isn't necessarily striving to be the same way. And this is so confusing, especially in a marriage, because you think you're, you're, you're like both fighting for the same thing. No, not necessarily. No matter how long you've, you've ever been in a relationship. So you think about that. Like, I just thought it was so interesting, just from a psychological standpoint. Like, why? I mean, every time she would miss or hit the ball up or whatever. She would say, oh, I'm sorry. I go, no, 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 no. Listen, baby, you don't have to apologize. See, when you want it bad, whatever, the, whatever it is, when you want it bad and you mess up, you're that kind of person that's saying, I don't want to be this way. I apologize. I don't want to. But how wonderful is it when you can look at somebody and you can understand why that person is a great apologizer? Maybe that person's a great apologizer because they want to be a better person. But just because you're a great apologizer, don't ever get to the point where you say, and we've all done it, where you say, it seems like I'm the only one that ever apologizes. Just know this, you're on a different track than even the person you're married to. Well, and I would say early on in our relationship, just that mentality right there, I always felt like, well, you needed to be the one that apologized the most. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and you're exactly right, I do. So I wanna to talk to all the A-type personalities in the room. People that you're strong-willed, you know you're strong. Okay, listen very carefully what I'm gonna tell you. You're gonna to have to apologize more. You're gonna to have to take the low road more. You're gonna to have to be the one that says, you know what, I, I don't, what, whatever this is, even when you're wrong, whatever this is, I don't want to create what I'm feeling right now. I don't want the dissonance that I'm feeling right now. 
So, so in our relationship, what would happen, again, we're not just talking about marriage. Here's, here's why marriage is the ultimate template for life and the ultimate business template. Because if you can make this work, you can make any alignment work. You can make any alignment work. Now watch this. As your marriage goes, eventually all of your relationships will reflect what you're not learning in your own marriage, how you can be better. If you're always focused on how this person can be better, or let's just take it outside of marriage, in a business relationship or in a, an employee-employer relationship or an employer-employee relationship, if you're ever focused on the other person and what they're not, how they're being, the way it's making you feel, in that moment, you can, you can make a strategic decision to go, you know what, I'm not gonna make it about them and I'm not gonna make it about that. I'm gonna make this about me being better. I'm gonna make this situation right now about me wanting to be better. So Sheila, to be compassionate. Again, if you grow like this, if Jesus was moved with compassion before every miracle, if you'll grow like this, you will be a miracle worker in your life. I said, you'll be a miracle worker in your life. If you need a miracle to happen, if you'll be moved with compassion. So compassion is understanding. It's empathy. You've already talked about that. It's emotional support. Like it's supporting. Like when Sheila's uh, dad was passing away, like I, I had a different relationship with her dad than she had with her dad. So, so I wanted to be empathetic. I wanted to be emotionally supportive for her based on what she needs. You never know how you're gonna be when somebody that you love passes away necessarily. Now I talk a lot about pre-decisions, but the reality is, is that a loss is a loss. I mean, when, once you have that loss, and, and I love what, uh, what Robert Shuler, uh, Dr. Robert Shuler, when he was alive, we shared the platform many, many times together. And one of the things that he said is his daughter was riding on the back of a motorcycle of a boyfriend and they had a horrible wreck. She was a great softball player. She lost her leg. And, and when he went to see her, he was so heartbroken because she was this elite athlete, this elite softball player. And he was saying, I am so sorry that, you'll, that you won't be able to play again. She goes, what are you talking about, Grandpa? Not, not being able to play again. She goes, I just, I just lost my leg. And I'm gonna have a different kind of leg. And I, and I also want you to know, I'm, and she goes, you taught me this. I'm not gonna focus on what I've lost. I'm gonna focus on what I've got left. Here's what happens to so many people. They, they start focusing on what they've lost and it keeps them from living the life that they have left. And yet you can't control everything. So again, emotional support, forgiveness. Uh, this is how we show compassion. We, forgiveness is the leadership apology I wrote for myself. I hope it speaks to you. But again, you gotta understand, like I have a gift of leadership. I know I have a gift of leadership. I'm a leadership strategist. I'm a leadership transformationalist. Like I'm gonna help people shape their philosophy of life. This is part of what God's called me to do. I'm gonna help them think better about what they're thinking about. Think about some things they're not thinking about. I'm gonna help them to be, to be the person that, that they believe God wants them to be, to do and to discover their gifts so that they can add value and be valued. I know very clearly what I'm called to do because that, the insight that I gained was I wanted to lead myself well. So at 64, I know I've got value to offer that way. Not that I have an answer for everybody, but as a leader, as, a, as having a gift of leadership, Sheila, I can know how I can help other people because of how I've helped myself. So when I write a leadershipology, the reason I say I hope it helps you is because in my own journey, in my own thinking, in my own being, in my own doing, in establishing my own philosophy of life, in trying to align my life with my core values that I established as a teenager and raised our family with, Forgiveness is the hardest thing you'll ever do, but it's the greatest thing you'll ever do. And so many times with forgiveness, we think it's an emotion. We think that yeah. when we go to forgive that person, we're gonna feel like it. I don't know if I ever have felt like forgiving somebody. It's something I've had to act my way into that, and then the feeling comes like, I'm so glad that I did. But when you forgive someone, it's an action that you take. And, and Josh... Stand up, son. What's one of your favorite leadership ologies about acting your way into a feeling? 
Just say it out loud to everybody. What's your favorite for me? No, it's your favorite. You know why it's your favorite? It's your favorite because you told me it was your top three. Like as we were talking, this is when you were a teenager, but what? Well, I mean, favorite in that I don't like it, but it's good, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's your favorite. It's painful, yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite. Like eating healthy is my favorite. So, um, so when I was a kid, Pastor Keith, one of the first kind of leadership apologies he taught me was, it's better. It's not easier necessarily, but it's better to act your way into a feeling than it is to feel your way into an action. Because I've been a person for a lot of my life that I'll do it when I feel like doing it, and yeah. uh, I don't feel like doing it ever. So it's so okay the, to come so, see so, me. At, so yeah. when I'm talking to my son, when I'm talking to Josh, okay. I'm not talking to Josh, I'm talking to his filter. When you're talking to your spouse, when you're talking to your child, when you're talking to a client, if you're trying to sell somebody something, you're not talking to them, and if you're focused on them, and if you're focused on your product, product, you'll be 50-50. But once you begin to get some insight on the filter that that person has, and you talk to that person's filter, If you value what John Brown values, you'll sell John Brown what John Brown buys. So if I'm gonna talk to Josh, I know I'm talking to his feelings. I'm not talking to his intellect. I'm not, so I I adjust everything. This is what makes life languages so important. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to do it. Do they have a way to do that, Josh? Can they go to our website and, and take the life languages? How's that done? Yeah, they can go to my, okay, you can go to my website, keithtrap.com, and there's a life languages deal you can take right there, an assessment you can take right there. Second only to the Bible, this has been the most important communication tool that I've ever done. And so I knew Josh was a feeler first. So early in his life, the way I was connecting with him is when I'm talking to him, I know that he's not hearing what I'm saying, he's feeling what I'm saying. And again, this is a skill that all of us can have. Are the people around you feelers? Are the people around you auditory processors? Are the people around you, are they, are they kinesthetic? In other words, do they, do they, do they is there, are, are they hearing it? Are they seeing it, auditory, hearing it? Are they seeing it visually? Or are they feeling it kinesthetically? Like it moves them because of what they feel. So many people in their relationships, they don't get it. That's three processes right there that I'm giving you. Are you talking to people that are visual? 60% of people are visual. They see what you're saying. 33 and a third percent of people are kinesthetic. They're, they're They're gonna feel it. So most people, and let me just talk about business for a minute. Most people, if you're gonna be Selling what you sell, you're gonna be having to help a person see what it is you're selling and feel what you feel and you feeling what they feel so you can sell them what they want. Only 6% of people are auditory. So how do, how do children learn in school? Unfortunately, by, by auditory. I mean, that's how they're being taught. That's how they're being taught. And that's, that's why so many kids have a disconnect. And I ask her this because she's a professional educator. That's part of why she married me and I married her. Is her degree is in elementary education and learning disabilities. And it's worked very well for us. And that's the truth. But, but here we, are, we have schools that are teaching all day long and, and they're connecting with about 6% in the room because they don't understand the dynamic of what I'm saying right here. So Sheila, part of being, again, part of being compassionate is knowing you're not talking to somebody, you're talking to their filter. So again, how are you compassionate? Through your acceptance of that person, through your effective communication with that person. And so we don't have a lot of time left, Sheila, but a compassionate marriage or relationship is built on the idea that everyone experiences some level of pain every day. And by honoring that and seeking to really understand it, you can grow closer to other people. 
When we grow in our compassion in our relationships, the following things will happen. And this is kind of what I, where I want to land the plane today. But the first thing, Sheila, is you'll increase emotional connection. Like, that's what I want with you. Like, I want, I want an emotional connection with you. Yeah, so it's the, if you're going to have an emotional connection, there needs to be where it's a safe place. That you can share anything and everything. You can open up about, you know, any fear or without any judgment. And so I think there's a lot of times in relationships where we're so quick to respond instead of just listening. You know, in our communication, it should be 70% listening and 30% talking. But a lot of times in our relationship, it's totally the opposite. We do more talking than we do listening. Yeah. So if I'm going to increase in my emotional connection with you, I'm going to do more listening, listening to where you are, without judgment, you know, and sometimes, I mean, we all do that in relationships. You and I have done that with each yeah. other. Well, we want to just help solve the problem, whatever it is, but you're not going to connect emotionally with your spouse or with a friend that's going through a tough time if you're not spending more time listening with the intent of trying to understand where that person is coming from. Yeah. And then the second thing, if you're going to grow in your compassion, you really do have to improve your communication. That's what we're talking about. And again, I wrote this many, many years ago. The more aware you are, the more care you can show. So again, improving your communication is, now here's, here's a problem. What happens is we walk in our own awareness. Really hear what I'm gonna say now. We walk in an awareness based on our limited experience, based on our personalities, based on our preferences. Like there's an awareness of what we like and what we don't like. Here's where relationships go wrong. When the things that I'm aware of, I make it about you rather than me. You say, well, what does that mean? Like if, I'm aware, if, I'm, if, I have, if I have a certain type of awareness, who is that awareness for first? Myself. Because your awareness, and the way I say it is your awareness is your careness. Whatever you aware about or become aware about is what you can care about. So what we try to do with, as in leadership, in, 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 a, in a leadership culture like Elevate Life Church, is we try to bring the level of awareness up to help you win in life. The awareness that, wow, servant leadership is a big deal. Like Jesus, servant leading was a big deal. He said, I want you to understand, you've gotta be willing to wash other people's feet. You've gotta be willing to serve other people. And if you'll serve other people like this, then you'll have a part of the kingdom that has your name on it, that God will release to you. But if you don't serve other people, then you're just self-serving. You're just serving yourself. So one of the reasons we, we established Elevate Life Church as a love-based leadership culture where people of all ages, all ethnicities, all walks of life could be developed to become Christ followers and then deployed into leadership in all walks of life with a biblical worldview is because we want you in, in essence to discover God for yourself. We want you to develop your gifts, your unique 1%, so that you can be deployed and lead in every area of your life, your marriage, your family, your business, not just to hold a specific leadership position, but to understand that wherever you go, things are gonna get better because you're there. The place where you work is gonna be better because you're there. Your marriage is gonna be better because you're in it. Your family has a chance to be great because somebody in the family wants to be great and that's you. And if our marriage and our relationships are going to be better, we need to focus on ourselves, maturing ourselves, not focused on what they're doing, but focused on what we need to be doing. And I think that's so many times we can get distracted in our relationships and think it's all about them. Now, if they would just do this, and if, if Pastor Keith would just do this, then, you know, I would be a lot happier. But the way he comes across or the, his actions or his intensity or all, whatever the things are that would sidetrack me because I'm full of emotion. I'm more of that emotive person like Pastor Josh. So if he's ever intense, then that shuts me down. But instead of going, okay, he's a very passionate person. 
So how do, how do I not need to focus on him and what he's doing right now? Because I want to say, well, if you just bring that down a little bit, and if you're not as passionate, I can hear it better. Or I can talk to myself and say, why are you getting so defensive? Why is that upsetting you? Right. You need to work on yourself. And if you mature yourself, then this, your relationship with your husband's going to be a lot better. Instead of focusing on what he's doing, focusing on what you need to do and mature and grow in who you are. And then I know our communication will be better. My sensitivity of how I feel right now that's affecting me will be better. And I start depersonalizing. And then I start growing in who I am. And guess what happens? I get really confident. Because when I'm growing in who I am and when I'm not being defensive, I become this confident person that it just makes me feel so secure. Have you ever felt that before? Yeah. It very feels good. good. Very good. So Sheila, again, the more aware you are, the more care you can show. Here's the opposite of this. The more aware you are, the madder you get. So it's going to be one or the other. Like I'm aware of how this person really is, or I'm aware, I'm aware of how this person really isn't. I'm aware of what my boss isn't. Like I'm aware of what I like and don't like. Again, where, do, where does our awareness come from? It comes from our preferences, like I said. It comes from our personality, what resonates with us and what doesn't. And, and so where does our awareness come from? From our own limited experience. So why is this so important? What do I do with my awareness? I don't wanna project that on somebody else Whatever I become aware of is something I care about that I want to make better, that I want to make better. Sometimes the way you make a marriage better is by you deciding to be better. I wanna give you just a little assignment. And the assignment is this. Ask yourself this question, and then if you have the courage, ask your spouse. And if you even have more courage than that, ask your boss. If you have more courage than that, ask your employees. Ask the relationships, the people that you have in your life, how could I be a better communicator with you? Like we used to have somebody that worked here all the time and they'd say, they would always ask me, um, what can I do for you? And finally I just started saying, just do your job. Because they weren't doing their job. <laughs> like I appreciate you wanting to do something for me, but let's start with just doing your job. By the way, they're not here anymore. But my point is, they would always ask me, like, what can I do for you? Don't, don't ask your spouse, what can I do for you? Listen, ask your spouse this question. How can I better connect with you? How can I better communion, communicate with you better? So I wanna give you that challenge. Ask yourself that question. Like, how can I be a better communicator but then also ask the people in your life that you care about and you know that care about you, how can I connect with you better? Now, I wanna leave you with this. The thought behind this quote of the more you're aware of, the more, you, you, the more care you can show is communication, how important is it? It is the way we transfer knowledge. It is the way we get to know another person's thoughts and feelings. It is a way to create intimacy or closeness with the people that we want to be close with. It is the way that we grow better. At the end of the day, it is the way we express and ultimately the way we connect with other people. Who you connect or align your life with will determine whether or not you will connect with any and every success that God has for you. I'm gonna read that one more time. Who you connect with, who you align your life with will determine whether or not you will connect with any and every success that God has for you. How many of you wanna be successful? Come on, you wanna have a successful marriage, you wanna have a successful family, you wanna have a successful business. You say, what's the definition of success? Functional, a family that works, a marriage that works. So again, let me, let me finish this by saying, just because you communicate doesn't mean you connect. The bridge, and we, go, we do deep dives on this when we coach, but the bridge between communication and connecting, okay? So just think about sales for a minute. I wanna communicate my message. How do I, how do I connect with the person that I want to buy what I'm selling? The bridge between my communication and my ability to connect is care. So how do I care more? Whatever you're aware of, you can care about. If you're not aware of something, 
you can't care about it. So if, if Sheila's talking to me about something to make me aware of something, I can't be defensive. Watch this. I can't see it as just attacking me. I can't see it as just hurting my feelings, what she's saying. If she's telling me something, I need to open myself up to say, she wants me to be aware of this so we can connect better. She's not just going in on me. She's not just attacking me. But she's saying, but that's what happens in my marriage. That's what happens in my relationships. It will happen that way until you learn what you need to learn about what you need to be aware of. Listen to the people around you and what they're saying. Come on, y'all. And that involves emotional intelligence. Many of you may have heard of emotional intelligence or emotional quotient. It's so important that we grow in that, in who we are emotionally, who somebody else is emotionally, how we process, say, a situation that I can just get all emotive about something that may be a disagreement that we have, but the more mature I am, the more I grow in my emotions, being aware of why I'm responding or reacting. And am I responding or am I reacting in this situation? But the, the more I grow in why I'm having these emotions and not just blurt it out, the more healthy our marriage is gonna be, the more healthy my relationships are gonna be the more I'm aware of your emotions and what you're feeling right now. And having, like we've talked about, having empathy towards that. I'm gonna be more mature emotionally if I really focus on where I am in my emotional intelligence. And there is a whole book on that. It's, what's the There's name? There's many, many, many books right, on that. They, they can but we, we recommend Emotional Intelligence 2.0. So it's just a very quick read, two or three pages, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Sheila, I wanna end with this, okay? If in our marriage, if you're talking to me about something or in any relationship, but I'm gonna talk about marriage for a second. If, she, if, she, if she's telling me something, here's the processor I'm gonna put on. She's saying this because she's aware of it and she cares about it. What I'm not gonna do is be thinking, again, you're attacking me, you're belittling me, you don't care about me. No, if, I'm, if I really wanna communicate with her for the purpose of connecting with her, if she's telling me something, and this is the person that loves me the most, hopefully you're married to a person that loves you more than anybody else because that's what God wants. But sometimes we don't feel the love, Sheila, because we, have, we don't have compassion for each other. So when you're talking to me, I want to listen to what she's saying. I want to try to unclog my preferences. I want to try to unclog my feelings. I want to try to make sure that my filter isn't blocking from her at least speaking to me. Josh and I will have many, many conversations about a lot of things that we're on different pages about. But at the end of every conversation, especially lately, I will tell him, Josh, listen, First of all, I want to tell you, thank you for caring so much. That's one of the greatest responses you can have when somebody's like going in on you and say, you know what? I know you wouldn't even be saying this to me if you didn't care about me. And all of a sudden, it just lowers your defenses. It lowers their defenses. That's the way I try to process. Listen, there couldn't be two more opposite people you're looking at than right here. We are completely opposite, and yet we're madly in love with each other. And you say, "Yes, we are." Thank Amen. You. Thank you so much. But I, as you're I saying hoping, that, I was hoping that, as you see, as he's talking about his role and receiving from me and receiving from others that truly that he knows cares about him and why he they're presenting it to him because I know you care and thank you for caring. Just as much as that role is important, my role is important in the timing of when I bring that to him and my, the way that I communicate it to him. Because if I'm going to talk to him and talk down to him and say, why did you do this? And why, he's not going to receive that well. He's not going to come from the posture of saying, well, thank you so much for telling me about that because I know how much you care. Because I came across as angry and frustrated. So I have to work through my own emotions when I'm feeling something in particular that I want to bring to him, that I'm not in a place that I'm angry and mad and frustrated. And that's where emotional intelligence comes in yep. and being aware and really 
this may sound spiritual or super spiritual, but it's really real in all of our lives. The Holy Spirit can lead you in what those best moments are. Yeah. And you can ask the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, I just know you're going to reveal to me the perfect timing of when I need to say this. Because right now, right in the middle of it, when it's heated or when something has just happened, and when he even particularly knows that maybe there's some, something that happened in his life or something he's frustrated about, that it's not best for me to give an opinion or to give my advice in this moment. That's why, like, even in between services, when you guys really cheer him on and say, listen, go ahead. He's like, I don't think I should say that. Should I say it? And he looks at me and I say no, and y'all go, yes. That's the only time you win over her. <laughs> and then in between services, I'll say, baby, they don't always, many people here she will not know your, hands on my face. your heart. And I just want you to know. And so I share with him tenderly and just showing just empathy towards him. I know this is really good and it's really good what you're saying. But then I just give him a little bit bigger picture. But then I say, if you want to go ahead and say it, I'm not telling you not to say it. I'm just giving you a different perspective of what may, how people can hear things. So I try to really yeah. be careful yeah. about how I word things. And I'm not saying I'm always. God might want me to say something. Yeah, exactly. And there are times like that. It wouldn't be what I would say, yeah. but it's what you would say. Yes. And I go, you know what? I'm going to trust God with that. <laughs> Thank and you for that. And trust him with you. But I just want to say, we both have two sides in the relationship. No matter what relationship it is. One where you really know when somebody brings something, it's because they really care. And then from the other perspective, just make sure that the timing is good and that you're sensitive to that. One last thing. We fixed something recently. I say we. She kept using my Superman cup. Now, I have a Superman cup, and I drink out of a Superman cup for a reason. Because I'm not about the kryptonite. But I'm about, you know what? If I'm pouring this in my body, it's adding super to my natural. Well, she would use my Superman cup, and she doesn't wash her stuff out after she uses it. I rinse it. I'm not washing it with soap. I just rinse it. So... I said, listen, I'd like to make you aware of something. <laughs> this may be an approach that will help you navigate some things. I said, I don't mind you using my Superman cup, but we got about 10, 10 other cups. I said, would you just this mind is always clean. not using my <laughs> Superman cup? Because I keep mine spotless, I keep it clean, and it'll just bring peace to my soul if you'll use another <laughs> cup. And you know what? Ever since then, my Superman cup has not been dirty, just laying there with her residue on it. So I want, here, here's what I want to tell y'all. Watch this now. To me, that could become, I know this sounds crazy. Some of us in our marriage, we become aware of something and we live frustrated about it without not only saying it in a nice way, but also giving another option. I'll get you as many cups as you want, but just let me have my Superman cup just to myself. Let's don't make simple problems irreconcilable differences. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for your word. When you grow like this, God, your word says that we will be productive and useful in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, may this family of choice, may Elevate Life Church grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding and favor with both God and man. God, thank you for your word today. And everybody said, amen. Thank y'all for being here today. Thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. If that message, if that content helped you elevate your life in any way, make sure you share it with someone today. Before you go, make sure you like, share, comment, subscribe. And we'll see you next time on our YouTube channel.